I'd like to do is, is talk specifically about a framing that I think will help people orient towards solutions, and I'll talk about a few specific elements of the science that are fundamentally different than they were just a few years ago when completed the most recent round of reports from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, where um, we produced a definitive statement of what we know and did know, but in 2016, what we know and don't know is really fundamentally different than in 2014 in some very important consequential and opportunity laden ways for the work that all of you will be doing in the coming years. So what I want to do is, is highlight these eight ways the world has changed since the last IPCC report in 2014. Uh, the first is that the idea that warming has stalled has gone away. The second is that we're finally seeing the beginning of the separation between a century-long link between emissions and heat-trapping gases and opportunities for economic growth. The third is that we're no longer in an environment where we can say, oh, this single event we can't attribute to climate change or we can't. Now we know a lot about the relationship between single events, the odds of single events, and human caused climate change. Um, no environment in terms of understanding the relationship between climate changes that have already occurred and economic damages. What's the sensitivity of world economies to climate change? We know a tremendous amount more about the relationship between climate change and sea level rise. And in particular, we know that the major ice sheets, Greenland and Antarctica, are up against major instabilities that can lead to commitments to very large multi-meters of sea level rise over coming centuries. I want to talk about uh, two aspects of the solution space that are also really, really important. Uh, the first concerns what we call co-benefits, uh, opportunities for not only addressing climate change, but uh, stimulating economic growth, building more robust communities, encouraging uh, equity, dealing with poverty in, in a way that we didn't really understand uh, even a couple of years ago. Um, talk about what, how I think the landscape has really changed in terms of whether or not the world community understood that the transition to 100% non-emitting energy is something we could accomplish. I think the answer uh, only a few years ago was maybe, and now the answer is clearly yes. And then finally, I want to talk about a couple of implications of the 2015 Paris Agreement, where 194 countries came together and said, this is a road for tackling the climate change. So uh, the, the starting point is that we need to understand the challenge of addressing climate change is the challenge in understanding, managing, and reducing risk. It's never going to be about definite uh, impacts that can be avoided, and it's never going to be about um, having 100% uh, certainty about the future. The way we deal with risk is the way we deal with risk in everything, in financial markets, in non-climate related natural disasters, in um, you know, decisions about highway safety. There's, there's always uncertainty, and we have sophisticated tools for dealing with it. But let me present a conceptual framework for thinking about the issue. Um, we see the risk of climate change impacts as really being embedded in a matrix of three major kinds of driving factors. One kind of driving factor is the hazard, the actual physical triggers from the climate system. Uh, the second is vulnerability, how susceptible to harm, how prepared are we to deal with Occur. And the third is exposure, I mean, what kind of assets are at risk, and if you've got a um, major factory or housing complex right at the edge of the country that has a different level of exposure than it's just a, a few hundred years back. Uh, there are at least five reasons that it's really important to think about the challenge of climate change, the challenge in managing risk. The first is that risk connects the future with the present, and we know we experience big damages from climate-related events now. And we can understand how changes in the frequency and intensity of those events will play out in increasing damages in the future. Uh, the second is that an emphasis on risk helps put the focus on climate extremes. You can think about extreme conditions as the sharp end of the climate stick. That's where things break, it's where damages occur, and it's where we need to be prepared uh, to deal with the kinds of outcomes we encounter. The third motivation for thinking about risk is that uh, risk framing helps us understand that we need to be alert to and prepare 
prepared for the full range of possible outcomes. There's a tendency in lots of kinds of modeling to say, well, what's the most likely answer? And look, we don't really care what the most likely answer is. What we care about is the kind of conditions that might cause severe impacts and about which we ought to be prepared. So just like when a bridge designer says we want to design a bridge for 10 times the maximum load under the heaviest imaginable wind, well, we want to design a society that can deal with climate if the outcomes are at the, at the bad end of the range of possibilities and not just at the most likely end. Motivation for thinking about risk is that we have a wide range of relatively successful, sophisticated tools for dealing with risk. And these range from insurance policies to financial <coughs> mechanisms to commitments to national security. Risk is something we know how to handle in society, and if we confront the climate challenge with the same kind of risk manager perspective that we use for everything else, we can be successful. A fifth motivation for thinking about climate as a challenge and managing risk is recognizing that climate is changing at the same time lots of other things are happening. A land use is changing, human population is changing, uh, political dynamics are changing, the um, level of education, the level of economic aspirations are changing. And all of these things fit together into a complicated matrix where the outcomes for a society may be primarily driven in some cases by the climate trigger, or they may be primarily driven, driven by a population trigger and others uh, with, with climate change acting as an amplifier. So we need to recognize that we live in a multi-stressor, multi-factor world, and then simply say, oh, we're not 100% sure this impact will be caused by climate. It can't be used as a, as a motivation for slow action. Okay, uh, let me move to the, to the first thing that's changed since Paris and, and uh, you know, there was a, has been a narrative uh, among climate skeptics that oh, warming hasn't uh, changed since 1998 when we had a huge El Nino year. And people could look at the trajectory of global average temperatures from here to about there and say, well, I, I don't see any warming. But that, the two fundamental things have changed. One is that there's been a growing appreciation that internal variability is an important part of the climate change trajectory, and if you look at the century scale pattern of temperatures, it's clear there have been some decades where they're found warm and others where they're warm. And it, it doesn't mean that warming is turning on and turning off. It means that the extra heat that's being captured in the Earth system is showing up in some places at some times in the atmosphere sometimes, and it's in the ocean at other times. What's especially dramatic about this picture, of course, is that the idea that warming stalled has been um, shown to be fundamentally incorrect by the temperatures in 2014, set a record, 2015, which was dramatically warmer at the global scale than any previous year. Warmer than all previous years by the largest margin, the first year where the global average temperature was more than one C above the industrial. And then, of course, 2016 has been warmer still. But we just had the 16th uh, consecutive month that set a temperature record, the all-time hottest um, I, don't, I haven't seen the August numbers yet, but the all-time hottest July, which followed the all-time hottest June, which followed the all-time hottest May. The first three months of this year were already more than 1.5 C above the uh, pre-industrial levels. And that's an important number because 1.5 now is the new uh, aspirational uh, target to be considered in the Paris Agreement. And we're already within a whisk of, of reaching that. Not to say that we're committed to that level of warming for every year in the future. There's still going to be a lot of important variables, but the situation is really changing. Uh, and, and it's even more impressive that the whole idea of a hiatus never really had any traction. Uh, this is a um, result of, of really nice work by the, uh, by the National Climatic Data Center. Uh, part of NOAA, but uh, Stanford groups have also done a beautiful job of demonstrating that there was never a hiatus, that the uh, trajectory of temperature from 1998 to 2012 basically was a part of the historical evolution of climate. What this figure shows is that if you um, do an accurate representation of the temperature uh, during this period, the, the average warming uh, was, you know, a tiny bit less than the average warming during the base period, but that if you actually look at the period from uh, 1998 to 2014 and compare it with the second half of the 20th century, the, the best revision of the numbers is in the square symbols, you see that the, that the rate of warming during this high period was in fact exactly the same as during the second half of the 20th century. There, there's 
simply is no evidence that there was ever any slowdown in, in temperature. And in fact, what we're seeing is this continuous dumping of vast amounts of heat into the Earth's system. Some years it shows up in much warmer atmospheres. In some years it doesn't, but it's still there and influences the way the system works. So that's the first thing that's different since the last time PCC report. The second thing that's different is we're seeing an uh, encouraging pattern emission. The, the message from the IPCC was that the pattern is actually quite grim. Uh, emissions growth rate from 2000 to 2010 was substantially faster than it had been in previous decades, uh, mainly a consequence of, of rapid emissions growth in, in China and India. Uh, but we've seen an incredibly interesting thing happen in the last couple of years, and that's shown here in a beautiful work from Rob Jackson, who's in persistent science. And uh, from 2013 to 2014, was a year of relatively rapid, slowly economic growth, two and a half percent or so. But emissions only increased by 0.6%. 2014 to 2015 was another year of healthy global economic growth, around two and a half percent. But there was, as far as we can tell, a decrease in CO2 emissions from fossil fuel combustion and, and uh, energy production and industry. And so for the first time, we're seeing a separation between what had been a century scale, essentially a rule of the way the world works. So if you want to be richer, you need to have higher CO2 emissions. But then we're finally seeing this break, and we're seeing it break as a consequence of differences in the way income is generated, and also more and more of the energy production by switching to lower emitting technologies. And I'll come back to this later. But it's a it's a fundamental difference that we really didn't know until the last few years. We could begin to see the separation. So that's the second. Uh, we look around the world. We are no longer in an era where we can say uh, climate change is a hypothetical future possibility. Look around the world now. The impacts of climate changes that have already occurred are widespread and they are consequential. Impacts of climate change from the equators to the poles and from the coast to the mountains. In the most recent IPCC report, we uh, produced a map of the kinds of impacts that have occurred and the places that they've been observed. There are a lot more places that have been observed in the developed countries and the developing countries where we've seen the impacts on physical systems, things like uh, the behavior of glaciers and flow of rivers, in biological systems, <coughs> uh, abundance of wildfires. Uh, the ranges of plants and animals, seasonal activities, and in human systems, things like food production, uh, the abundance and frequency of conflict. Pretty much around the world, we've seen impacts across all the major parts of the Earth system, and impacts that have really made a difference. Uh, here's the pattern for North America, where the most prominent impacts that have already been detected and attributed to the climate changes have already occurred include changes in snow and ice, changes in river flows, changes in wildfires, changes in the distribution and abundance of plants and animals, and changes in agriculture. And here's, an, here's an example of the kind of change we're seeing. This is from, uh, from Greg Asner's work at Carnegie, uh, who's also a part of the Earth System Science Department, and based on a uh, comprehensive airborne survey of California's forests. How many of California's trees are water stressed as a consequence of the uh, profound drought that began in 2012 and we're still in now? And this is a, a map of the water content of the state's forests, and the redder colors are, are less water, more drought stress, and this indicates severe drought stress for something like 60 million trees. So we now know that this drought, in which we can clearly identify as being more likely as a consequence climate changes that have already occurred. It's having real impacts that are playing out not only in the death of trees, but in increased frequency of wildfires, insect outbreaks, and a wide range of secondary consequences. Before I, I move on with impacts, I want to um, return to this issue of vulnerability and susceptibility to harm. Who is it that's susceptible and why? And we, we have tended historically to think about vulnerability to impact climate change concentrated in the world's poorest and people in a refugee camp in Sudan. And there are certainly lots of reasons that poor people are especially susceptible to impacts of climate change, and that includes you know, 
weak governance, poor institutions, uh, limited financial resources, lack of access to insurance. But what's striking is when you look around the world and ask where it's damages as a consequence of climate related events are occurring now, they're not just happening in the world of poor areas. In fact, um, rich areas are by far suffering the highest economic damages. And this is a picture of uh, New York City following Hurricane Sandy in 2012, a region that experienced $60 billion of economic damages as a consequence of, a, of something that had been degraded from a Category 1 storm to, a, to, a, um, to an extra-tropical storm. So what we see is, is an increasing evidence of profound sensitivity vulnerability to climate around the world in rich regions as well. I want to move to the future now and talk about sort of where are we in the, in the uh, arc of going from seeing observed damages to, to future risks. And the way the IPCC characterized it is the more warming that occurs, more we face a risk of impacts that are severe, that are pervasive, and that are irreversible. The, the clear message here is, is not, not one of, of a depressing message, but it's one that if we can limit the climate change to the lowest amount possible, something in the order of 2C above pre-industrial, we can avoid many of the impacts. I want to talk a little bit now about what some of those impacts might look like. Um, the first concerns this topic of single event attribution. You know, just a few years ago, the narrative from the climate science community was, well, we expect an increase in various kinds of extremes from climate change, but we can't really attribute any single event to climate change. But as a result of some really uh, beautiful statistical work, I know a different loss group here has contributed a lot to this, we now can assess for single events how much the climate changes that have already occurred have altered the odds of an event like that. Uh, so for something like 80 events that have been analyzed in detail, uh, those that, have, that are related to heat waves or extreme hot spells, uh, we see that something like 95% have a climate change signal. A good example is the European heat wave of 2003, which led to many tens of thousands of deaths. We know that the probability of an event like that was at least double as a consequence of the warming that's already occurred. If we look at heavy precipitation events, about half of those show a climate change signal. And when we move farther and farther away from warming, the, the extent to which the attribution uh, detects a climate signal goes down and down. So for droughts, it's about a quarter. Uh, for things like wildfires, a few single wildfire events, or the wildfire season in California in 2014, really severe, has been shown to be more likely as a consequence of climate change already occurred. And one of the interesting features of this single event attribution work is that we're increasingly in, a, in an environment now where people can talk about uh, you know, uh, getting legal satisfaction as a result of damages from climate. And at least it, it really sets up a very good dialogue about the way climate change damages are going to be uh, assigned and, and settled. So that's the third thing. A fourth thing that's changed has to do with economic damages, and really, really difficult to say <coughs> this hot period or this uh, series of climate events uh, resulted in a change in economic output. Uh, Marshall Burke, Stanford scholar in the Department of Earth System Sciences, has taken a really creative approach along with colleagues Saul Shane and uh, Berkeley, but they said, okay, well, let's look at global macroeconomic performance over decades and say, well, how do countries shape out uh, in terms of global economic or their national scale economic growth in cooler periods versus warmer periods, and recognizing that when we see most of the climate impacts unfold, they unfold in a nonlinear way, so that when conditions are cool, warming may actually produce benefits. When conditions are hot, warming may produce uh, damages or, or other kinds of challenges. And, and that's exactly what um, what Burke and colleagues found is that when they look at the, uh, the global macroeconomic growth rates, they saw that areas that are cool, cooler than about 14C on average, uh, did better in warm periods. 
areas that are hot and warmer than about 14C. 14C is the annual average temperature in San Francisco. Um, is that, uh, that there were profound damages. And then just to feed the sensitivity of the damage, they would court it from this national scale macroeconomic data. <coughs> what they found is, is a, a, a profoundly important and really troubling pattern. It's that the, the cool countries uh, tend to do better with climate change, the countries that are shown in, in, in blue up there, and, and warm countries tend to do much worse. Uh, the, the goal average for continued high emissions is, is something like 23% uh, lower global economic output in 2100 than we would have expected in the absence of the climate changes. So we have a profound uh, anchor on uh, global economic activity. What's even a greater concern is that the distribution is so unequal. And so you can see that the uh, range of estimates for Europe across the bottom is, is continued economic growth as a consequence of the recognition that Europe is now at the cool end as the warming actually does. Um, much of the world the world, the, the world that hasn't contributed to the climate changes that have already occurred, uh, is in a position to face severe economic consequences with a uh, change in per capita GDP on the order of 75% or even more as a consequence of continuation on a world of, of high emissions, the, the world that we're now in. And if you look at the bright red countries uh, across the map, what you really see is that the countries that suffer the biggest impacts in economic growth for those that have contributed the least to the climate problem as we experience it now, but are also the countries that will in the future uh, need to utilize a wide range of sources in order to generate economic growth that will move their populations out of poverty. So that's gradually where I'm going in the last few minutes of, of today's comments. But that's the fourth way that the world has changed. I just want to talk about one more impact area, and this concerns sea ice. Modeling sea ice is an incredibly complicated uh, geophysical problem. It has to do with how uh, the solid material flows across complicated landscapes. It has to do with uh, the, how, how stable these large ice cliffs are. It has to do with the consequences of changing the uh, the conditions of the interface between the ice and the rock as a consequence of meltwater is really hard to deal with. So historically when we've talked about sea level rise, we've mostly talked about thermal expansion as the main contributor. And for those of you who are coffee drinkers, you know that a, the hot cup of coffee doesn't take up all that much more volume than a whole cup of coffee. But uh, there's a tremendous amount of sea level equivalent locked up in the world's ice sheets on land. About seven meters of sea level equivalent, about 26 feet on the Greenland ice sheet. And, and right around 60 meters, around um, over 200 feet of, of sea level equivalent on the Antarctic ice sheet. And one of the things that uh, has come out in a really dramatic and important series of papers just in the last few months is the mechanisms by which, especially the Antarctic ice sheet, where, where much of the ice is called grounded, it's sitting on the on the rock but below sea level, is susceptible to, to rapid conversion to, to liquid water. And it has to do with the stability of these large ice cliffs. Basically, you get a, an ice cliff that's hot, taller than about 100 meters sticking out of the water, and the, the ice isn't strong enough to support itself, and it begins to collapse as a consequence of gravity. And when you build this, um, new recognition of the sensitivity of the um, instability of the ice cliffs into the model, come out with a, a new range of contributions to sea level rise for Antarctica, uh, showing that with, in a world of continued high emissions, the red line there, we're looking at 2100 commitment to sea level rise on the order of an extra meter. It's on top of the thermal expansion, the contribution from glaciers and the contributions from Greenland that are driving the, the bulk of the sea level rise to date. Uh, what's most concerning, especially for people in low lying island nations, is if you send these results out to, uh, to 2,500, the commitment doesn't look like uh, one or a few meters, 16 meters of sea level rise by 2,100. But the implication of this is that climate change really becomes an existential issue for people in 
inside the nations around the world. It's not a question of um, how am I going to reshape my economy and my culture in order to deal with this. But many rely on the nations are simply gone, and the only possible uh, adjustment in terms of adaptation is to find somewhere else to live. And so I think this um, this recognition of the very large potential for long-term commitment to the sea level rise is one of the motivations that's driving the renewed discussion about the importance of ambitious temperature targets, including targets below 2C. And here you can see the uh, implications of stabilizing climate uh, at, at 2C or better, looking at only a quarter of a meter of sea level rise at the, uh, the black line across the bottom here, as compared to the almost 16 meters with the world of continued high emissions. I should say that the, the uh, pattern we've seen over the last few decades in rapid emissions growth, and even though that's beginning to change, as I showed you, uh, that the expectation if we just you know, step back from addressing the challenge is that we would continue on the, the path of, of high emissions. Okay, so that's the, that's the fifth thing that's changed, and, and now I want to go from the super depressing part of my comments to what I hope will be an uplifting part, and, um, and it has to do with how to, how to think about solving one of the key pieces of framing in the most recent IPCC reports is the recognition that we kind of have a, a carbon budget that we're working with. And for all time, what we need to do is figure out how to uh, limit the cumulative amount of carbon emissions that occur. Now, a few years ago, people were thinking, what we really need to do is uh, get emissions down and, and stabilize. But that's not right. What we really need to do to solve the climate problem is bring emissions of long life heat trapping gases like carbon dioxide down to zero. Uh, and we have a carbon budget by which it has to come down to zero. If we want to limit warming to 2C, 2.5C, 3, whatever. And um, that the budget for 2C is about um, two thirds used up. At current rates of emissions, we, we hit that budget in the order of 20 years. So you can think about the, the challenge that all of you are dealing with when you think about addressing climate change is that if we want to stabilize at 2C, we need to find a way to move the world off of fossil fuels, <coughs> zero emitting sources, over um, something that uses the remaining budget. Um, but which represents only a couple of decades of current emissions. Uh, here's another way to think about it. This is based on the specific simulations of the, from the most recent IPCC report is that continued high emissions lead us to an atmospheric CO2 concentration of about 1,000 ppm CO2 equivalent, 0.100. Currently, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere is a little less than 450 ppm of CO2 equivalent, about 400 ppm. And then if we look at stabilizing warming at 3C or 2C, uh, the striking feature of these trajectories is that they reach zero greenhouse gas emissions somewhere toward the end of the 21st century. And in fact, this 2C trajectory actually tends to go below zero. We talk about mechanisms that we might use for actually removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and transferring it to long-term storage. That's been an area that very active research is standard, and one that is likely to be important. Uh, but for the 3 C trajectory, it hasn't quite reached zero. 2100 has got to reach zero eventually. And, and even higher amounts of warming eventually need to reach zero. So the striking feature of all of this is that when we talk about solving the climate problem, no matter whether we solve it with ambitious mitigation in something like 2C, less ambitious than 3C, or, or, or we uh, go through the 21st century accepting very high levels of damage and let stabilization occur at 4C, we still eventually need to bring CO2 emissions to zero. So this isn't a question of whether or not we will off of fossil fuels. It's really a question of when. And if we do it sooner, we can avoid damage. I think there are also good reasons to believe that soon, quicker action will lead to a wide range of benefits, including, uh, and I'll make it during the later, uh, strong economic. I want to spend just a couple of minutes talking 
talking about what we might think of as the solution space for the climate challenge. And it's got a, a number of components, not just investments in non emitting energy systems. So the first thing to know when we think about designing a solution space is that climate change has to be understood as a challenge in managing risk. And we need to manage for things that aren't known, as well as for things that aren't known. Uh, adaptation, a uh, commitment to coping as well as we can with the Climate change that can't be avoided is really building momentum. And we're learning more and more about what can and can't be done in adaptation. Say the, the most striking thing we know about adaptation now is that we can't adapt to everything. There will be some damages, and the more the climate change, the more we won't be able to adapt. Uh, mitigation is building momentum, and you'll hear a lot about that this week. You'll hear a lot about it in, uh, in your careers at Stanford. You'll be able to contribute a lot to the investments in moving us away from uh, greenhouse gas and technologies. And, and the point that I'm going to end on is that in the past we used to see uh, essentially three buckets of alternatives that were competing with each other. The one was investments in economic development, the second was investments in mitigation, decreasing the amount of climate change occurs, and the third was investments in adaptation. Now increasingly we see that there are a wide series of of uh, uh, multiple wins on the bottom line where an investment in mitigation can also yield benefits in adaptation and also <coughs> yield benefits in sustainable development. And that's where I want to close. Um, first, let me return to the, the place we started. Uh, this is the historic relationship around the world between uh, per capita GDP and CO2 emissions. So uh, per capita emissions ranging from about 100 pounds per person to about 10 tons per person per year. GDP ranging from about $100 to about $50,000 a year. Striking a linear relationship on that. Uh, Although, uh, uh, historically, the challenge that we were all here to address is we need to break this relationship and find a future where we can drive economic growth this way. So at the same time, we're driving emissions down. So that relationship. And here's uh, where we have to do it. This is per country emissions. Uh, the most recent years, emissions from China have been more than the total from the US and the European Union. And um, really, in the case of when we think about where emissions growth needs to be tackled, it needs to be in the rapidly developing world. But we also need to recognize on a per person basis, emissions are still highest in the developed world. You can see that here, where this is per capita emissions now. Uh, the, the global average <laughs> is around uh, six tons of CO2 equivalent per person per year. Uh, the US is still about three times that level. And, um, and there are a few small countries, including Canada, that are substantially above it. But one striking thing about the pattern of per capita emissions is it varies dramatically around the country, and there are lots of lessons in this. Uh, I, I, this per capita emissions state by state, I, I grew up in Wyoming, which is, uh, <laughs> and it's no great uh, claim to pride. But in California, we do have a, a lot of claims to pride, where, where our emissions are only about half the U.S. average, and they're, they're typical of per capita emissions in, um, in the European Union. And part of the reason for that is that uh, we, we have a, a good climate and don't have to spend as much energy on heating and cooling as in other parts of the world. But part of it is that California really has been a leader in the implementation of climate solutions, and that's been everything from air quality standards to, to building efficiency standards, cool climate efficiency standards. And, and a lot can be learned in many ways. California is a laboratory for ambitious investments in solving the climate problem, and it uh, makes it a great place to think about and try new things. Um, close with a, with a few thoughts here on the, the, the nature of the issue that we're trying to address, and this is the, the contribution of different energy sources to U.S. electricity generation in, uh, in 2015. And you can see that about uh, two-thirds of current generation is, is coal, gas, and oil, with gas growing rapidly as a result of increased availability and lower prices through hydraulic fracturing. Um, but what we need to do is eventually figure out how to move away from all the emissions. And even though gas is uh, per unit of electricity delivered about twice as efficient as CO2 generation as coal, it doesn't get us all the way. A beautiful work by Rob Jackson has also demonstrated that 
fugitive emissions from gas can cause about as much climate change as the coal. So we need to think about going beyond gas as a, as a bridge to a cleaner future, to really eliminating um, carbon emissions. And, and we know how to do that, and then we'll talk a little bit about how, what we know. Uh, we, we know that wind and solar have increased amazingly rapidly. Uh, from 2006 to 2015, we saw 52 times the increase in the deployment of solar and U.S. electricity grids, uh, more than a seven-fold increase in, in wind and U.S. electricity grids, but there's still a, a tiny, tiny fraction, and there's a lot that still needs to be understood about how to build the grids. So this has already begun to describe, and many of you will think about that can manage the large amounts of these renewables, and what we do about uh, storage and distribution. But I want to talk about another thing that's really changed in the global dialogue over the last few years, which is about the feasibility of doing that. So here are current and projected prices for different electricity sources, coal, uh, natural gas, combined cycles, solar, PV, and wind, uh, for the present and only 10 years in the future. And the striking thing when we look in the, in the future is that if we look at uh, the solar PV and, and wind, at least the low end of the ranges for levelized cost of electricity are, are cheaper than the low end of the range for both coal and natural gas. So we're already moving into an environment where, at least in principle, the renewables are cost competitive, may even be cheaper, if we can figure out how to build a, an energy system that can accommodate very large amounts of these renewables. And can we do it? Uh, we don't know. But it, it increasingly is clear that, that technically it's within the realm of possibility. And this is a beautiful result from Mark Jacobson, who is in civil environmental engineering, showing uh, the, the basic problem we face, which is that there's a vast amount of intermittency and the availability of electricity from uh, wind and solar. And that doesn't line up very well with load. But what Jacobson and his colleagues did is they said, well, let's make some really heroic assumptions about uh, load shifting and about um, uh, thermal storage and everything we could think of that would allow us to build an energy system that could accommodate vast amounts of renewables. Can we match supply and demand? And what you see in the, in the top figure is Jacobson's group showed that with really ambitious commitments uh, to building out the storage and load balancing <coughs> and demand balancing components, it at least looks like it's technically feasible to build an energy system entirely on renewables. Now, we probably don't want to probably be too expensive and, and an energy system that's got um, fossil with CCS that has some nuclear is likely to be a lot more robust and cheaper and, and more reliable. But we, but we could do it, and I think that's an important change in the way the world works, and I would call that the, the, the sixth way the, the world has changed since the last time we see it. So uh, the, the seventh way is uh, that we're entering an environment now where we see lots and lots of opportunities for co-benefits. We see opportunities for co-benefits in terms of jobs. I think everybody's seen the statistics that we've seen dramatically more new jobs in solar than we've seen jobs lost. Um, improvements in terms of health, worldwide estimates are that 7 million people a year die as a result of air pollution. The premature mortality in the U.S. as a result of particulates from coal is probably between 10 and 20,000 people per year. Profound benefits from moving away from coal as an energy source. But we know that lots of places in the world have wonderful access to renewable resources and can potentially use those renewable resources as a as an engine for development in a way that wouldn't be possible at all for fossil energy. And, and in, on a similar vein, there are lots of opportunities for building out equity as a consequence of, of thinking hard about incorporating new energy technologies into a society that's focused on um, building stronger institutions and, and uh, addressing the issues that are so important in, in poverty. And then finally, we can see lots of ways that have commitment to uh, 21st century energy system can help build stronger communities. So I think that's really the seventh way that the world is changing. And the eighth way is that uh, we now have a way to address what are the two biggest challenges with 
of addressing climate change and how do you make it fair? And how do you ensure a kind of a stable policy environment in which moving forward companies and communities can be confident that their investments are going to continue to be on long run? So with Paris, we've got a universal binding agreement where every country makes a real commitment to emission reduction. Uh, they did that through what were called intended nationally determined contributions, and they range from a very ambitious huge commitments to emissions reduction from the European Union to uh, really ambitious but longer term, the Chinese commitment to peak ambitions by 2030, to ones that are still getting their act here, where many developing countries are really talking only about changing the carbon intensity of their energy system. Commitments to finance and technology, and then potentially most important, especially in an in innovation driven like environment like Stanford, is an increasing recognition of the role of non-state actors where what we really want to do is empower a situation where companies and communities can contribute to uh, the vital energy system for the 21st century. So that's the, that's the eighth way the world has changed and it addresses the fairness issue, it addresses the policy continuity issue, every country in the world is agreeing this. So uh, this is where I want to stop. We, this is a problem we know we can solve. It's a problem we know we need to solve and it's a problem that uh, kind of careers that all of you are undertaking will be uh, the, the absolute engine for. So I, as I close, I want to celebrate your commitment to working with all of us to solve the problem. Be happy to take any questions. was whether, whether renewables, wind and solar, have zero CO2 emissions, and that's a great question. It depends on, on how you make the technology, right? So, um, making silicon TVs, I'm getting outside my air expertise, but you have to melt the silicon crystals and grow them, and so there's a huge amount of heat input that's required. You know, where the electric, where the energy comes from for making the PV is important. Uh, what powers the trucks to take the PV out to where they're going to be is important. And, uh, and, and how the rest of the system works. But as we get more and more of the energy system based on renewables, those um, external sources of emissions gradually drive down. So that eventually we can do it. Uh, there are some places where we don't really have a vision of how we're going to get rid of at least the need for liquid fuels. Airplanes is the classic example. And there we may be able to use fuels from biomass, which are potentially zero emitting. Or we may eventually need to have ways that we're removing CO2 from the air in order to offset continuing emissions associated with these difficult to eliminate sources. Uh, How do you feel about Stanford's decision not to digest fossil fuels? Um, <laughs> yeah, so the, the question was uh, what, what about uh, should universities divest from companies that uh, or produce fossil fuels? And uh, what I think is that if for each of us, but especially for people who are involved in investment, we've got to think about our lifestyle. You know, what, what, are, what are the emissions that are associated with what I do? Um, our, our vote style elections really matter, especially the one we've got coming up. And our invest style. And I think it is really important to recognize that uh, that large amounts of money are, are flowing around and, and, and uh, encouraging some technologies and discouraging others. On the other hand, uh, so, so all those things are super important, but for me personally, it's hard to imagine the kind of rapidity of the transition we need without having major oil and gas companies be, at least to some extent, a part of the solution rather than just a part of the problem. And so I've seen what I understand and believe to be really compelling opportunities for uh, helping major oil and gas companies see that they want to be a part of the solution. I, I say that campus energy is a really key part of this, and I hope some of you are interested in, in understanding and, and contributing to um, pushing Stanford toward a zero emissions profile, the new central energy facility. Which do people get to see that? Yeah, super uh, compelling 
increase in the overall efficiency and the ability of the university to use uh, present renewable energy is, is a really big uh, component. And I also want to say that uh, you know, when, you, when you think about investments, you need to recognize that right now um, we have an energy system. You saw the graph, it's about two thirds based on fossil energy sources. And if we were to shut that off tomorrow, which is in some ways what a vote for divestment would be, but we would make economic activity around the world grind to an immediate halt. We would basically be uh, eliminating the legitimate aspirations for economic growth for millions of people. So, so we can't turn off uh, emissions tomorrow. We need to figure out a way to gradually transition in a way that uh, lets as many actors as possible be a part of the solution. And for me, the real question is how can we make the transition occur most rapidly rather than a way that, uh, let's say, assigns blame most efficiently. I think I'm at the end of my time now. Is that right? Okay, thanks very much.